Hi, Marty. Hey, Leo. So we're here to do a sort of conversation about our, our work together for Letterbox, talking about films that, you know, influenced each of the movies that we did together. Yes. I was asked what films I introduced to you, but considering you've seen every film ever made up until 1980, it's pretty hard to say. Other than maybe Spirited Away, Miyazaki's films, and maybe Princess Mononoke. It was Spirited Away that you tell me to watch. Marty, you, have, you always have had this amazing process for the actors when you, when you do a movie. Sometimes it's, you, you have these screenings and the entire cast and crew is invited. And sometimes, what's so beneficial for us as actors is sometimes it's for the overall tone of the movie, but sometimes in the case of The Aviator, for example, it's just for one scene. It's to show the Technicolor process, or it's to show the interactions and the type of dialogue you would have. For example, in The Aviator was the dining room sequence. You, we, you wanted to watch uh, His Girl Friday. One of the greatest things about the picture is the speed of the language. Some of that was in the original too, in the front page and on stage and in the film version, the front page but not not as, as uh, I think, rhythmic and as uh, musical as Harry Grant and Roz Russell uh, playing with each other in His Girl Friday. The speed of the picture is only equaled by that movie, Babyface. Maybe Goodfellas, maybe Goodfellas, but you know. It, it was hard for us as actors to understand the concept of what you were saying for that dinner scene because there was so much overlapping dialogue. There's overlap, yeah. And really intelligent, uh, jokes and quips, and you wanted us to watch that whole movie, the entire cast, just so you could understand that you wanted us to overlap everything that we said and everything had to be a light, at a lightning pace. However, here, John Logan's script was very specific. Mm -hmm. And what I went back to was Orson Welles and what he brought to film, besides everything else in the sound era, he brought radio. And if you look at an Orson Welles film and you look at a Howard Hawks film, both uh, utilize overlap dialogue that sounds so natural, but I know, I know that by the third word of one sentence, the other actor has to come in with his or her line. Mm -hmm. And by the second word of that person's, the other person comes in this way and that way and that way and that way. And it's all like a, an extraordinary uh, string quartet of some kind. Um, and you could see this in any Wells film, but primarily you, you really get it in Howard Hawks. And there you have it in His Girl Friday. I gotta tell you, you, should, you kids should look at the thing. Not only John Carpenter's wonderful uh, uh, version that he made, which is so extraordinary because it still holds up. It really still holds up a terrifying film. But I saw The Thing, and I think I showed this to you. Yeah. Because The Thing is a very deceptive movie. Yes, it's a horror film, so to speak. And I saw it when I was a kid, and it was in a theater maybe filled with 2,000 people screaming in the audience when certain scenes occurred. More so than any other movie that we did together, I think we screened the most for the Aviator because you were playing with three different color processes. In that movie, you had the, the early sort of 1920s on to the 30s and then into the 40s, great Technicolor. So you were doing massive screenings. And I don't know if a lot of people know that about the movie, but you had three different, very unique processes from decade to decade. But of course, I remember as you were doing your hand gestures, all our screenings of Hell's Angels by, 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 directed by Howard Hughes as well. And all those insane World War I planes going through the clouds, his obsession just, with, with being able to show perspective and having to have, realizing that there were no clouds in the background to show where these planes were flying or what was happening. That's the thing last night I said, and I, I talk about shooting Killers of the Flower Moon, when, when they took me on location scout in Oklahoma. Um, they put me in an SUV of some kind, I don't know, big, big thing. And I'm sitting in the front and they said, we're going to this ranch, the Hughes Ranch. And they were driving, I think I told the story a number of times, but we were driving and driving and driving and driving and driving along a road and driving along a road. And I'm saying, I'm going to a ranch, how far could it be? I mean, I, we were going on for like 40 minutes and I look around, there's still nothing. And I said, why are we going so slowly? We're going so slow. And I look at the speedometer, we're doing 75 miles an hour. The reason why it, it appeared so slow is that there was nothing going by. It was all flat prairie. Hence, the airplanes against the clouds in use. I, I fell for it in Oklahoma. I still didn't get it. <laughs> and if we're talking about other 
references that I had. I remember Andre Baida's film Ashes and Diamonds for The Departed. You were very specific about wanting me to see that performance and the idea of, you know, here we are, you know, Poland, World War II, but he's dealing with this moral conundrum, trying to figure out what's right. If he's, if, and the, and the anxiety, the constant anxiety and internal tension that the lead character feels in that movie. So I remember that was a big influence on me making The Departed and, and, and portraying. Really Primarily, possible. I wanted you to see Chabulski, the actor who was mm -hmm. really, he would have been, I mean, on the level of, uh, he would have been as known as Mastroianni or any of the great um, uh, European or Eastern European actors who uh, became international. But he was tragically uh, killed uh, shooting a film uh, a couple of years later, running onto a train, a running train, he fell. It was a great loss, but he was considered like the, the European James Dean. Mm -hmm. You picked up in the film, you said at one point, say, hey, this guy's good. When well, you saw him do something with the, at the bar that he was fooling around with the girl mm -hmm. behind the, uh, the counter. This guy's good. And he had those glasses. Mm -hmm. And I've always used those glasses myself in homage uh, in Mean Streets. And I've always worn them uh, when I was shooting because Ashes and Diamonds was so powerful when I saw it. Uh, I must have been 20 years old. And here's this guy who's stuck. Ashes and Diamonds takes place all in one day and night. Uh, Departed doesn't. But your character in Departed is stuck in the shooting war that he didn't plan on. And he's getting shot at. He doesn't know what, he doesn't know why he's there. He does, all we know is that ultimately he's trying to find out what's right in this world with no morality of any kind. It's, it's ground zero. Maybe, maybe, maybe the psychiatrist uh, played by Vera has some, uh, like a lifeline to him. And what happens to this poor guy? For the first time in his life, he gets some direction. He falls in love and he, he dies. And the same as in Ashes and Diamonds. Yeah. And he's doomed from the beginning. Um, and there's something very beautiful about it because at least he finds that life for those few moments, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's that desperation. You know, here in Ashes and Diamonds, you have all the political aspects. You have the Soviets coming into Poland. You have the Nazis leaving. You have all, all of this. He suddenly, he's an assassin for the, um, for the partisans. But all of a sudden, he's turning on his own men. He's told to kill somebody that they had just supported. Mm -hmm. Now, who's who's wrong? What's going on? Who's? It's becoming authoritarian. And, and, and instead, he finds this love, and he doesn't know where is the moral foundation in all of this. In particularly, the political systems. You know, you have fascism, right. Nazism and fascism is out. Soviet in. Now what? Mm -hmm. And suddenly, the same people are being killed. Like it's crazy. And meantime, he says, why can't I just love this woman? And bam, it's over. You know, that's really symbolic of, of you know, of, of, of the whole war generation. I felt that Billy, Billy was that way. He was stuck that way right. in, a, in an urban war. Nobody right. could be trusted. No one. And when you, Leo, mm -hmm. when you're sitting having coffee with her, you, your head, you're always looking around. You're looking around who's coming in the door, who's behind you. He winds up taking OxyContin. Remember his, his mother's medicine? He can't take anymore. You know, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, thinking about it, there were so many things in that movie that I that I pulled from to to do the departed. I I also remember Shutter Island. Oh, yeah. You were talking claustrophobia, paranoia, Nazi Germany. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about Crossfire and why. <laughs> I, mean, we, I remember seeing a lot of film noir with you in, in that. I don't remember everything, but there were three films, mind. and it was uh, Laura, Out of the Past, and Crossfire three key films I showed you. And a lot of it, Laura had to do with the nature of the detective. The down and out detective had been shot in the leg. Uh, he drinks too much. And he's seen it all. And that's Dana Andrews. I noticed that being around a lot of policemen and inspectors where we were doing The Departed, that they walk in a room and they look at the room differently. They check everything out. They check the people. And that's what Dana Andrews does in that film. He just slides through all this. This woman's been murdered, right? And he slides through it all. He just look at everybody's suspect. He plays a little game. There's a little mechanical game he has. He never takes off that hat because you had to wear that hat and shudder. And there was this attitude of a guy who's seen it all, who's been beaten down. Mm -hmm. And what happens? He falls in love with a ghost. And then all of a sudden she's alive. I mean, it, it reminds me very much of Shudder. I mean, it's not, Laura's a masterpiece. I'm talking about where we were aiming. Um, and the other one was 
uh, of course, uh, Crossfire, where Robin Mitchum, Robert Young, and um, uh, Robert Ryan playing a crazy anti-Semite. Mm -hmm. They killed Sam Levine. And there's a remarkable scene uh, with Paul Kelly, uh, where this young guy, a uh, soldier who's who's being framed for the murder, he's he got drunk and he's blacked out. And he thinks he may have done committed the murder. So he goes to see this woman played by Gloria Graham. I mean, quintessential B movie, uh, quintessential noir, I should say, not B. I said B because a lot of these noirs sometimes were in the second half of a double bill in those old days, you know. In any event, um, he goes to her apartment and there's this older guy there played by Paul Kelly. And he says, I'm here for so-and-so. And he goes, well, she's not here. And the guy says, sit down. And then Paul Kelly starts to tell him, you know, That's, she's my wife. He goes, oh, I didn't know that. Da -da -da -da. Paul Kelly goes on. And Kelly was a very interesting actor. He was a very tough man in reality. I think he had served time for actually manslaughter, this guy. He was very tough. And then he sits down, he looks at the, the, the uh, young man again. He says, you know what I just told you about her being my wife? He says, yeah, I was lying, she's not. Hmm. Then he goes on and he does it again. You know what I just told you just then? I was lying. There's an imbalance, at, like in Shutter Island. He doesn't know where the truth is. And what he's looking at. No, I remember actually watching those movies and, and realizing I am sort of somebody that's embodying that or trying to be one of those sort of tough, hardened noir detectives. But you realize the whole movies, to watch it a second time, it's all a farce and everybody's actors around him. Yes. He's like doing a one man show, so to speak, in that movie. <laughs> I know. I believe it was a glass and then the glass disappears and then people are kind of roll the guards are kind of rolling their eyes. And how like a lot of the guards are sort of bored and they're uh, they're going along with some ridiculous like it's high school absurd play. Way. But everyone's kind of faking it. Everyone's faking it. Yeah. Reminded me of like I was watching Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factor and Gene Wilder and how Gene Wilder's sort of sarcastic with every one of these kids and people, but you have to watch the second time to realize all the players around me are essentially playing and catering to my character's whims in some elaborate school. And I thought that was the beauty of, of trying to make that film where we kept the audience untethered, so to speak. It, people tend to want a, a neatly uh, wound up uh, story. Or everybody uh, changes their arcs to the character. But what if life is not like that? What if we can make a work of art, good, bad, or indifferent, that doesn't reflect that? that reflects the ambiguity and the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. That's why Laura, this guy falls in love with a ghost. All of a sudden, the doorbell rings, it opens up the door, and she's standing there. I, You know, it, right. it, it, suddenly, what's the reality? What, what did he feel? Does he feel the same way towards her as he felt towards the portrait in his mind? as he's looking at the portrait of Laura. I was thinking of Gangs of New York. I know we we screened Barry Lyndon, which I had never seen, which I was blown away by, which you wanted to show me the authenticity of that period. I remember you talking to me about how uh, Kubrick essentially had to make his own lenses to capture yes, the yeah, candlelight yeah. in that movie. I, I, I think in Wolf of Wall Street, we saw films like Scarface. I do know for Killers of the Flower Moon, we were highly influenced by Montgomery Cliff's work. and. You know, we had an original storyline that was kind of set for killers, but then I think that the, the, you know, the key for me and you was seeing a place in the sun. This was such a twisted, bizarre relationship had to do with the corruption of the American dream greed and what lengths Montgomery Clift will go to, to have a different life for himself. And of course, it culminates in the murder of his wife. And I highly remember really the template for the Molly Ernest relationship being Olivia de Havilland in, in The Heiress. And that was recurrent through the entire theme of making the movie. The Heiress is really the one. Even as we were shooting the movie, I remember us not really understanding how much we wanted to understand that Ernest was complicit in all this, how much we wanted to reveal to the you know, audience, but it really helped me with the relationship with Montgomery Clift and Olivia de Havilland and the manipulation uh, of, of that relationship. And then that culminating, of course, in that final sequence with her and I at the end of the courtroom where she finally gets it. Well, I, it, it was a very interesting thing because, you know, does Morris in, in uh, uh, The Heiress, uh, Washington Square, based on the uh, Henry James book, um, does he really love her? You kept saying. And I said, I don't think so. I think he's really after the money. But we pursued that thought. 
that he really did love her, and he wanted the money too. You know, I think that a lot of a lot of the the stories that we heard from the Osage was this is probably one of the most twisted relationships I, I've ever come across. But they kept insisting he did love her. He did get a life sentence for her. Yes, he did. He did. And ultimately, Gail was coming not only after him and his children, but her. And at the end of the day, he 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 did what he had to do. It's not a form of love that you and I are possibly familiar with no no but 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 you know the human human nat- human nature is so complex under those circumstances in that world at that time people are capable of this you know are we capable of it in the same circumstances you know um it's extraordinary uh, what happens with him and her that's why i kept the camera on you a single shot on you uh on the witness stand because we could see you you can see everything you do you you do love her and you're admitting admitting to killing her family or you know you 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 admit to it all but i can see that you're sorry i can see that it's almost it's almost something like you didn't know meaning in a sense for her you're saying i couldn't help it i was stuck it was my uncle i had to do it i didn't think it was going to get this far please forgive me it's all there on your face without saying it which is quite beautiful then ultimately she does give you the answer she just gets up and goes well thanks Marty. i think that That's our time.